Hello everyone. On today's tutorial video, we're going to be doing something other than flying. We're simply going to be focusing on the engineering panel of the Tupolev 154 by Felis. Uh, right now, we're sitting here at Tomotevia Airport, which is just to the southeast-ish of Moscow itself. And I thought this would be an appropriate airport to be parked at, because it just so happens that several of our cousin little planes are kind of hanging out with us today. Anyway, let's get started. So to get to the engineering panel on this aircraft, you normally press numpad number 9, which jumps inside just like this. Now when I first sat down to look at this panel, my mind was just blown. I've been flying these simulators for a very long time, and every once in a while you see a plane where you're just overwhelmed. But uh, the good news is, it's not nearly as scary as it looks. And the other thing is, a lot of it's actually fairly intuitive once you start kind of understanding it. And hopefully I'm able to help you understand that panel today. If you want a complicated looking engineering panel, by the way, go look up at the B-36 bomber. It had, in the, at least in the H version, six propeller engines as well as four jet engines, plus the world's most complicated fuel system ever. Unless, of course, you're a Beechcraft fan. But that's not uh, something we're going to discuss today. So let's get started. First thing we're going to take a look at is the electrical systems on this aircraft. Now the electrical systems for some people are just mind-boggling. There's a lot of switches, there's a lot of different buttons, there's inverters, there's rectifiers, there's bus ties, but the good news is a lot of this is actually set up to be fairly automatic, which is definitely to its credit. And as complicated as the two systems are, there's really one AC system and one DC system and then another AC system, and then another DC system, and then there's another sneaky AC system, which is single. We're not going to worry about that today. For those of you who would really, really like to see a nice technical version of this, if you actually were to pop up on the internet real quick, there's this uh, beautiful PDF. If you type in TU-154 electrical system right up at the tippy top, it's at pe.org, that has wonderful little diagrams and great reading material for those of you who would like to learn a little bit more. I'm going to summarize. So first things first, uh, we have our four batteries on board. Our batteries are just good old-fashioned conventional batteries. They're sitting way out in the tail. To connect those on, we're just going to go ahead and click these four switches. Now one thing I wanted you to notice is that if I click this off, you'll notice it gets dark. Because believe it or not, these batteries are connected to separate sides and separate buses. If we wanted these two to actually be connected to each other, there's a system tie switch right here that we can actually link, which means if we shut all the batteries off except for one, we're actually running the entire airplane on a single battery. Good way to kill it, guys. Of course, if I click this switch, light goes back out. So now go ahead and turn those back on. Now, we don't want to be sitting here running on DC very long. One thing you'll notice is we're not actually generating any AC, which is, again, to our credit right now because we'd absolutely melt those batteries. So we need another power source. We have two choices as far as what on the ground before engines are starting. Our first is external power. The second one is with the APU. So I'm actually going to go ahead and get us some uh, external power. Click on the ground panel. You have this little guy that says ground power. Click that. You can go ahead and select that to make sure it's connected. You can see it's connected, but notice there's no current being drawn from it until I click the switch here. Whoa, there we go. Now we got some stuff. Now the um, AC systems are currently linked together and everything is being powered through them. Now, the way this plane works is there's basically a very, very high power AC system. Then there's a transformer, which transforms that super high voltage into something a little bit more manageable for the instrumentation. One of the nice little things here is if you look down here, we have the PTS-250 inverter. This is the actual system that powers a lot of the uh, avionics, the automatic pilot, a lot of the instrumentation. We can actually connect that in line, because right now you can see it's off, by lifting this panel and hitting this switch. Again, Again, we can do that now, we can do that later, you'll see in a minute. So anyway, one thing you'll notice is the front bat light is still on. The reason for that is because the AC system is powered, but not the DC system, which a good amount of the plane runs off of. So to connect this system to this system, we have to connect to rectifiers. If I go and take a look at our little diagram right here, you can actually see those rectifiers built right into the system. All right, so now the battery lights are off. I could actually shut the batteries off. You should never do this. And the DC system will continue to operate. That's why our lights are still working. So go ahead and go ahead and flick those back on. Now, if we wanted to actually power something that required an inverter, we'd have to turn the inverter system on or start the engines up, which will automatically engage it. Certain instruments also will trigger the inverter to connect. So uh, we're not going to use that just yet. But what we are going to do is get the APU fired up while we're at it. 
Now one thing you want to pay very, very close attention to as you're utilizing this plane is looking up here and keeping an eye on the draw we're using. By the way, this instrument is completely useless if you're not actually pointing this needle down here to the system that you're actually drawing power mostly from. You can see we're pulling barely two or three amps here, which really isn't too bad. When I go to start the APU, this needle is going to spike. If at any point you pass 150 amps, it's going to cause that system to drop out. You're going to see all the red lights come up. Sometimes instruments will shut off, they'll turn on. It gets really, really messy. So you want to kind of keep an eye out for that when you're working. So anyway, more than enough, we're going to scroll down to the APU panel. Pretty straightforward. Before we ever start the APU, it's very, very important that you turn on the fire protection system. If you actually scroll up here, there's a switch right there. This is set on FPS. Go ahead and click that switch right there. You also want to give it a quick test. Good. Now we're good to go. So I'm going to click on start. Click on start, not crank. Crank, by the way, just runs the thing without actually applying fuel to it. And then I reach down here and I push that button just like that. You're going to notice the rectifiers actually came off for a second. And then they're going to re-engage in just a moment. If we were, yeah, I just missed it. Give it just a moment. Good to go. So now uh, the APU, we just need to wait until it gets up to full speed, and then we can actually start working with it on other systems. There we go. Awesome. So I'm going to climb up here. Go ahead and turn on the APU. We can double check to make sure it's actually generating stuff. There we go. And you can see it's not really pulling very much out of the system right now because the ground power unit's kind of doing all the work. But that's okay. We're going to give it a workout in a second. By the way, some of you may be curious as to why they have the little gauges called phases. This is using a three-phase power system on board. What that basically means, for those of you guys who are scientifically, is that your AC current comes in three different phases. It's sort of a simple way to increase the power without adding a lot of extra weight to things and kind of keeping things kind of simple. So you can actually have a different voltage and a different amperage depending on what phase you check. I'm not sure how well this is modeled in the plane, but I just tend to leave that switch alone and I've never found a case where I've played with it and actually found it to be different than the other two systems, which is to our credit. All right, going back to what we're doing here. Now, the first thing we usually do in this plane is we like to pump up the hydraulic pressure so that the plane doesn't roll away when we start it. To do that, we come down here to the hydraulic panel and we click on these two switches. Now, a word of warning. When you activate these pumps, the power draw is going to be very high. If I actually float back up here for a second, you can see we're pulling almost 30 amps. If you got this going and you got this going and you got stuff over here going, you're probably going to pop the breaker. Now, let me point out something very interesting. These red lights went off in the middle. Now, if I actually would click the switch right here and give it a moment, you're going to notice the red light on that side goes out. But none of these instruments are actually displaying any value. The reason is because this is on a different electrical system than the system we already have connected. If I want to actually be able to see those values, I have to turn on this inverter like that. Now you'll notice it actually shows that I've got good constant values. I'm going to go ahead and hold this switch real quick. What I'm basically doing is pumping up the emergency brake. These are all accumulator systems, so if I shut them off, they keep running. Uh, I should say they keep pressure until I use that pressure up by using the brakes or something along those lines. We'll come back to this panel in just a moment. I just want to give us just a little bit of uh, pressure. Good to go. Go ahead and close those like that. And we are awesome. We now have our brakes. To make sure our brakes actually got set, however, we're going to scroll down here. And you can see that they're showing positive pressure. If I press the brake button, yeah, we're engaged. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and float back here. Now one thing I'm going to do, and you're going to see why I'm going to do it in just a minute, is to go ahead and turn on the APU bleed. What I'm doing is connecting the pneumatics of the APU to the rest of the pneumatic system on the airplane. Once this light goes out, that's a good sign that everybody's connected. By the way, make sure this is closed before you start it, or especially make sure it's closed before you connect the manifolds to the engine. You could have a real big problem. Anyway, scrolling up here. So this is our engine instrumentation. I'm going to go ahead and reach down here and actually hit these three switches to turn on the engine instrumentation. Because without that, we're not going to see very much. Uh, it's not the warmest day outside, but you can kind of see that our engines are pretty cold right now. You've got some warning lights in here. Again, if I wanted to check them, you can press lamp test. And if you hold the right mouse button while you're holding that, you can actually stick your head around and take a look at all those warning lights all at once. By the way, when you get to 2,500 kilograms in the tank number one, this light is, light is going to come on and all the sounds are going to start going off and you're going to be like, how do I shut it off? How do I shut it off? There's a switch right up here. This is 2,500 kilogram fuel reserve sound signal. 
you just click that switch off if you want that to go away. That doesn't make your fuel state problem go away. It just makes the sound go away. It's kind of handy. Anyway, if you take a look right here, we have our engine instruments. We have a 1 and a 2, which we can't see because we're not running at the moment. Basically, you can see here, point to 1 is the high pressure system. Point to 2 will be the low pressure system. We have our temperatures. We have our individual uh, oil pressures and temperatures. And then we have our fuel flow gauge, which is very important, and it's in 1,000 kilograms per hour. We have our vibration system down here. We can actually test each one of those gauges individually. Generally, if your engine's vibrating uncontrollably, something's really, really wrong with it, and you tend to get a lot of warning lights, you can actually see them right up here that tell you something's going horribly wrong, so you don't exactly have to pay too much attention to that gauge. These switches here allow you to pick which sensor you want to actually detect the vibration from. All right, moving on. Before we do the fuel panel, we'll float down here to the hydraulic system. Remember, you're not going to get any values on these screens, number one, if there's no pressure, and number two, if our inverter is not connected. So it is, and we're good to go. So basically, you have two electrical pumps and a bunch of engine-driven pumps. The electrical pumps are usually left off except to charge it on the ground like I have here. Uh, you have this button here that allows you to connect hydraulic systems. Be really careful with this, because if you hit this switch when you're leaking hydraulic pressure in one system, the leak's going to spread. So you've got to kind of keep an eye on that. Again, we can do a quick little lamp test right there. It looks kind of like a Christmas tree. It's crazy. Now, the hydraulic system basically has three places where buttons are located. You've got them here, you've got them here, and then you've got them over there, which are going to be the important ones, and we'll talk about that. So once you've got pressure in all your hydraulic systems, you can see we've got plenty of hydraulic uh, reservoirs. We're good to go. You want to go ahead and actually connect the hydraulic system to the individual servos on the plane. To do that, we're going to float up here like this, and we're going to go ahead and click all these switches. Now, just because the servos are connected to hydraulic pressure does not mean that the controls will move. We have to actually float over to here, where you have this sit right here, and turn on these three switches and close this. This enables the actual controlling. I could actually wiggle the controls right now, and the plane would wiggle because we do have pressure, we're connected, and the boosters are online. Good stuff. All right, let's take a look at the fuel panel. Now, before I can talk about the fuel panel, we've got to talk about the fuel systems on the actual airplane itself. So I'm going to go over to the load page, make sure all that's good. Good. Basically, it, it's complicated, but it's not too complicated. You've got the plane itself. You've got to remember that the engines are in the back, and the engines are extremely heavy. So you have to generally bias the loads in this plane towards the front. One of the greatest things about this little setup is I can come down here and press the 100% button, and it basically creates a load of passengers. It's perfectly balanced. For those of you who um, feel like doing a cargo run, generally you want to start by loading cargo up in the front, paying very close attention to those. Generally, six or 7,000 kilos is enough, usually 1,000 at the back, something like that. Now, as far as the fuel calculations and things like that go, you could do the math. You could use a software to do it for you or something like that. That's fine. You could also use this to optimize and calculate things like that for you automatically. For some of you, though, you may wish to load fuel into the plane manually, and I'm going to show you why. There are a total of one, two, three, four, five, six fuel tanks on this plane. Two of them, if I jump outside real quick, are located in this part of the wing. Another one's located in this part of the wing. Then you have a fuel system right in the middle, and then you have this guy up here who's tank four. Because of that, you enter into an interesting situation where you could have center of gravity problems. You can also solve center of gravity problems. So let's say, for example, that um, I want to shift the takeoff center of gravity forward a little bit. Like I can see right now, my takeoff center of gravity is way towards the back. Maybe we want to come to the front. So what I could actually do, instead of adjusting my load, is I could put more fuel inside the front of the plane and then gently burn it off. That's a wonderful thing to do, except pay very close attention that we haven't done something silly like make our center of gravity for landing or our zero fuel center of gravity get very strange. But this is a very, very powerful way to get that plane that extra bit of balance to make it that much easier to take off and land. So I'm going to give this thing a nice, nice full tank. Now check this out. Our takeoff center of gravity is now going to be 25%, but our landing center of gravity is going to be 18%. So what we're going to have to hope that we do is to burn off some of the fuel that's in the outer tanks first. Or the, um, yeah, 
be very, very careful how we burn our fuel off so we don't accidentally create a situation that makes the plane unflyable. So again, be very, very careful with this, but for power users, it's a wonderful way to really customize every little part of your plane. I, for example, find that it's kind of tricky to put fuel in these tank the outer tanks, because they're so far back. It's much easier to put fuel in the middle tanks. Make sure whatever you do on this page, you come down here and press the load fast button. By the way, memorize this number. All right, so let's go to the fuel panel. Now, in order for anything in this plane to work fuel-wise, we have to actually turn it all on. So if we come down here where it says fuel quantity indicator, we click that switch, we can see our fuel quantities come on, and I'm going to turn on the flow meter as well. Now, the way that this plane works is you have the individual fuel tanks. You have a left needle and a right needle. You'll see that as you burn one side more than the other. And you have a total system fuel, which you can see up here with the little uh, letter C. Now, one thing you'll notice is we have a flow meter on this plane, like we do on a lot of Russian planes. Basically, this is considered unreliable. This is considered more reliable. It simply adds up and integrates how much fuel I burned over time. The problem is you have to tell it how much fuel you started with in order for anything to work. So um, instead of using this, it's much more safe to actually come over here and double check. It should be 19,675. And it's about right there. So again, this is going to almost be a more accurate indication of fuel over time than this is. By the way, if we want to test the individual needles, we can go ahead and press, and you can actually see it change the total system fuel up at the tip top. Kind of neat. Anyway, so on um, the tank itself, we want to go ahead and turn these switches on. This is the automatic equalization system. We want to go ahead and turn on the fuel management system. Fuel management basically decides what fuel tank it should be pulling from automatically. You can see that light came on. If I shut this off, we're going to actually be trying to pump fuel into the main tank. By the way, the main tank on this plane is tank one. If you remember this little diagram right here, he's the guy who's kind of in the back center of the plane. All engines draw out of this tank first and everybody else basically feeds into them depending on how the management system has been set up. So right now I'm going to go ahead and turn that on automatic. Coming up here, here's our fuel pump switches. An important note, these things draw a lot of current. So when you turn these on, you're going to notice this will go up pretty considerably. So watch out for that. Good, 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 good. We're still pulling out of the uh, ground power unit. So this is the service tank one. These are the individual fuel pumps that are inside of the main tank, which feed it directly into the firewall valves down here. If we go ahead and open these three switches, we've actually provided fuel, which you can see up here, to the engines themselves. We're actually in a position where we can start this airplane, but we're not going to be doing that just yet. Now, some people might say, well, what if I want to just pull fuel out of uh, tank number four, for example? That's actually pretty simple to do. All you have to do is shut off the fuel pumps to those individual sections and set that over to manual. So what's going to happen is you're going to see this little light come over here. It's only going to pump fuel out of tank four directly into the system. If you want to create a rather dramatic demonstration, you can actually go back to the load menu and you could empty this tank out a little bit. And what will happen is you'll notice this needle is going to start lifting up over time as it sucks fuel out of tank number four. So you can look really carefully and actually watch that needle start to draw. This is a very slow process. And often it is just safer and easier to leave everything on automatic. But again, feel free to ma manipulate things as you feel needed. Okay, so that's our fuel system. By the way, at the top of the fuel system, you have these three instruments here. This is exactly what you expect, airspeed, altitude, and descent and climb rate in meters per second. It's a good idea to set this instrument along with everybody else's because it makes it easier to set up the pressurization, which we'll see in just a moment. All right, talking about pressurization, let's float over to there. Now, the pressurization system on this airplane is not terribly complicated, but it's definitely more involved than some other systems you may have seen on other aircraft like it. Basically, what you have is you have a source of air. You feed it into a system here. It goes out to a left line, a right line, and then it goes out into the individual ducts and then the actual cabin itself. One thing to keep in mind is you cannot pressurize this plane if there's any open doors or windows, so kind of keep that in the back of your head. So right now, our primary air source is going to be our APU. If you remember a minute ago, we opened up the APU bleed. So if we were to actually come over to here where it says mass air sup, these two switches basically limit the airflow, especially if you're coming off the engines. Go ahead and turn those two on. We're good to go. You'll notice that nothing's actually changed in these two airflow instruments yet. The reason being is we haven't really opened up the pressurization valves. There's a little teeny tiny bit of pressure being leaked through the right system that's actually accurate, and it's giving just a slightly smoother experience. To actually provide air into the system, we come to the pressurization valves, click and hold like this, 
And in comes that fresh air. We'll actually be able to cool this place off in a second. You just want to hold it until it goes all the way up. Good to go. All right, now we've got air. By the way, never open these if the APU isn't closed off and running. You're going to blow the APU up. Be kind of careful. All right, coming up. So this allows us to select which one of the ducts we're going to check. I like to check the cabin duct. Now, if we want to cool things off on the ground, we have to actually open this up. This also includes heating things on the ground, which is pretty handy. If we want to really, really heat things up quickly, we can play with this switch. It's kind of dangerous, so be careful. And then, of course, we can come over here and actually automatically select the temperatures inside the airplane. The set for temperature, I prefer 21, 22 personally, but you can set it to whatever you feel. And you can actually check the front of the cabin or the back of the cabin by hitting the switch. You can see right now that outside it's 27 or so, inside it's about 22, which is about roughly where we set it. If I wanted to heat things up in a hurry, I could reach over here and click the switch, but uh, I think I just melted all the uh, ladies in the back of the airplane, so, whoops, sorry. Um, you might be curious as to what these two switches do. These basically preload the duct system to get a little bit warmer, a little bit colder. So if I were to crank this thing higher, it's going to heat this up, making it uh, work a little bit quicker. The only time you're ever really going to change this switch is if it's extremely hot outside or it's extremely cold outside. But I find leaving it at positive 10 seems to be the way to go. Floating up a little more. We have the first half of the pressurization system on this plane. On the left side is a classic instrument you guys probably recognize from other planes. Our outside scale tells us what the cabin altitude is. Inside scale gives us the relative pressure differential. You can see in this aircraft we don't like to get a pressure differential higher than 0.82 which is pretty substantial but in practice we actually leave it at about 0.6. As far as cabin altitude goes we don't like to get this too high otherwise we're going to get an alarm going off to tell us that um, we don't have enough air to breathe and that particular alarm is up here. You can go ahead and shut that switch off or if we like we can go ahead and touch that to go ahead and take a listen. Very, very useful. This tells you how fast it's going up or down. To actually control this system, you can see we actually have negative pressure, which is a little concerning. You have to actually trick your head downwards and come down here to the floor. The needle on the left-hand side allows you to control what you like to set the cabin exactly to. So if I wanted to set it to, say, sea level, I could say about... 760. The guy here on the right allows you to dial with the pressure, di pre uh, pressure differential the airplane is. Notice it's locked at 0 0.7. 0 0.6 is kind of the common value. Someday we'll have this little speed switch as well, but not today. So anyway, now that we've done that, the plane is all pressurized, and since we actually have an air supply, the plane actually did pressurize itself. In the event of an emergency, if you need to depressurize in a hurry, you can just lift up the switch and click it right here, and everybody's ears pop painfully as that exceeds a very, very high number. I'm going to go ahead and close that off and let the plane repressurize itself. Cool. All right. Coming over to here, we have our stopwatch. It's a simple stopwatch. I press the button to actually get the flight timer going. Press it again to hold it. Press it once more to reset it. On the right-hand side is a more conventional stopwatch. If I click that, it gives me up to 60 minutes of time. That hand there actually times everything down. Stop, reset, good to go. This is our outside air temperature. This is our starter air pressure. The only way we can actually get this to show a value is to open up this hatch here, turn on the main switch, turn on the starter. It's actually going to start redirecting air away from from the regular pneumatic system into it, you can actually see that our airflow dropped down to zero because of the amount of air that this draws out of it. Generally, I like to close the pressurization valves prior to starting the plane. But we can go ahead and shut that off because we're not going to get started. Now, we'll take a look at a couple ancillary things that this particular aircraft has. Floating over here real fast, we have our servo hydraulic power. We have our automatic pilot system. This is basically a little check page on it. If we actually powered up the a, um, automatic pilot, this little light would come on eventually to let us know that it's working correctly. We have our fire protection system here. We can go ahead and test the different systems just like that. If we need to release them, we've got everything that we need right there. Coming over to here, we have the ice detection system. You hit that switch there. Press and hold test. You should get two lights. That means it's working correctly. You have the individual anti-icing systems in here. If you wanted to, for example, uh, warm up the heat valves for the hydraulic stabilizer and wings, you go ahead and press that button right now. This gives you a little bit of a temperature warning right here. On this side, you've got some little lights to help you out a little bit. Depending on, of course, what's going on, you can make this panel brighter if you like. Some cargo lights, service component, landing gear compartment, everything like that. And in the event that you need to ditch the plane, here is the ditching plane thing, which basically closes the plane off to all the air from the outside. So that is the basic gist of this particular engineering plane, um, engineering panel, rather. Now, there's a couple extra.
extra things that were kind of thrown in that are up here as well. Up in the top right, you have your flight data recorder. You can turn it on there. It tells you what time it is. You have the main switch, and then you have the auxiliary switch to make sure it works. If you're so inclined, you can actually dial in a specific route number in here. You can also test the lamps. It's kind of a neat little detail. Coming over here, we have a couple of little systems right here. We can actually turn on the door heating, which should always be on if the temperature is less than uh, freezing, I believe. If I remember reading, the reason the switch exists is because the doors used to not close properly when it was too cold outside. But uh, I could be completely wrong on that. We have some dump pipes, which we're not worried about. We have a water filling system. We can click that switch to tell us what the water level in the uh, tank is. Again, there's a bunch of water tanks on here. If we want to actually add water to it, we have to click these two switches right there. And you're going to notice that this guy right here, if I turn the lights on, is actually going to gently fill the plane up. There's no in-game penalty other than virtual annoyance by the flight attendants. We have some components to check for the tail as well. We can uh, turn that on right there. We can actually heat that system up as well, test to make sure everything there is working. Not really critical. I'm not 100% sure what exactly the consequence of leaving that on or leaving that off is at this time. All right, so there you have it. We have a very, very detailed panel for this particular plane. If we wanted to go ahead and get things started, we are in pretty good shape at this point. Keep in mind that um, none of this instrumentation was turned on because even though we did turn the inverter on, we didn't hit the individual breaker switches all the way up here to turn all that stuff on. While it is possible to run a lot of this at one time, keep in mind the power load is going to be very, very high. Uh, one thing I want to warn everybody about also is that when you do turn things on and off, just kind of keep in the back of your head uh, what you did or what you didn't do. Because once in a while, I make the mistake of uh, I hit the switch, for example, maybe there's too much fuel on that side, and kind of forget about it. And next thing you know, I'm wondering why the plane is pulling to the left or to the right. There's not a lot of warning lights and warning sounds unless you really, really overdo it. All right. Hope everybody enjoyed the tutorial. If you have any questions, let me know. If I made a horrible mistake, make sure you let me know as well so I can put a comment down below to correct it. Have a great day, guys.